Okay, so good morning. So last week uh, you have seen uh, uh, OWL with Professor Corno and then with me the process of building uh, an OWL2 ontology uh, in general. And then you did the last of the three exercises, so we have no more exercise for the exam for this course. Today what I would like to do is three things. The first one is to introduce you to the semantic reasoning. A brief overview, I would like to take something like one hour, more or less, on this, uh, just to better understand what happens when you in Protégé click start reasoning. What to expect from that, uh, which are the issues, which are the things that the reasoner could do, and the things that the reasoner could not do. This set of slides is quite large for this purpose, but I keep that in this way because you can have some reference if you need to understand better or go in depth to some details. Uh, we would not uh, build a reasoner from scratch, so we, I would like to give you an um, overview of the main concept just to understand how things work. The second thing that I would like to do today is again a brief overview on how to program for the, web of, uh, for the, semantic, uh, for the semantic web. So after Protégé, after tools like Protégé, what you, what, what you can do in a programming language or something like that. Uh, given that the audience is quite varied this year, I will give you just some brief information. I will not program live here. And on the website, there is already an example of a, a, a simple program that query, that navigates the ontology we developed last time and just to print out on screen some information as a point to get started and have some idea on which framework, which library exists and which of them you can use. Finally, in the third part, I would like to have you do something, especially for what concerns the reasoning. So you can take, for example, the ontologies you realized last time or the university ontologies we realize in class and try to understand which change can you do for having the reasoner uh, perf uh, for having an inconsistent ontology or to create or to solve some problem with the reasoner so that if you have something unclear you can ask and we can solve the issue at hand in that moment and this is the third and last part is the same exercise but it's not an exercise for the exam it's just to a practice to better understand this concept of reasoning and to understand that if you expect a problem that the protégé uh, present to you or not. So this presentation is split in four parts. Uh, sorry, next time on Wednesday, we will not have any further uh, theory oriented or practice oriented uh, lecture, but we will have two seminars on what we call the research topic on semantic web mm -hmm. and we will have two people one from Eurocom uh, in France that is working on uh, semantic web applied to the music domain so he realized uh, inside a national project in France an um, ontology for handling and managing music source, music types, and so on, and also some software upon of that, a, re, um, a recommender system, and something like that. And this is the first seminar. The second seminar will be of a PhD student of this uh, university, and will be about uh, the usage of uh, uh, semantic web technology on how to enable, let's say, normal people we call it end user, so people without any specific technical knowledge to personalize their web service, their Internet of Things device, and so on. And he will present an ontology as well 
and some software application here allies. Again, our recommender system is included in this. Just to give you this brief uh, uh, overview on how it, we can take these and bring them in the research world in different domain. So just two examples on domain. So today in this first part, I would like to speak about this semantic reasoning that you already saw last year, last year, last time, last week. Uh, and this presentation is split in four parts. I will skip some of them. We will start from a general idea on which, what we mean, what, what we mean for reasoning, and then we will go depth on o OWL reasoning. And briefly, if we have time, I will introduce you to SWRL, that is a language for rule-based language for uh, ontologies. So when we think about reasoning in ontologies, we don't have to think, as you imagined last time, about a reason process, a human level reason process. But reasoning essentially is a way to make ex implicit fact explicit. So you already have all the information in the ontology, the reason process make the implicit knowledge that you already have in an implicit way and try to present it to make it explicit. So here, for example, we have a brief example. We have that a mammal is a class and then we define that canine is another class that is a subclass of mammal and then we say that daisy uh, let's say that this is uh, an individual, is of type canine. So if we read that, like in this way, we know that daisy is a canine, and then we know that canine are a type of mammal. So explicitly, we are just saying this true information, that exists some classes, mammal is one of them, canine is one of them, canine is a subclass of mammal and daisy is a canine. Stop. We are not saying anything else explicitly. Then if we think about it for less than one second, we can also say, obviously, that since daisy, daisy is a canine and canine is a subclass of mammal, so probably daisy is also a mammal as well. This is an, explicit, uh, an information that is not explicit here. This is an implicit information because we can uh, by memory, by thinking about it, go through uh, the entire chain from the individual daisy up to the mammal class. So the reasoning process in general is the answer of this question, how to derive the implied information, how we can make evident implicit information. So reasoners are like the one that we used in Protégé, application that perform this type of operation that are called inference. We inference new knowledge, we make explicit, implicit knowledge by using reasoning engines or reasoners. A reasoning engine, by definition, is a system that infer new information based on the content of a knowledge base and how the reasoner typically infer this new information, it uh, uh, infer this new information by applying some rules, some type of rules. And various reasoning approaches exist in general, not only in the semantic web domain. For example, we can have rules and rules engine to execute these rules, or we can have triggers on database, for example, on uh, or for an RDF store, you can have decision tree, you can have uh, tableau or hyper tableau algorithms, algorithms or R coded logic for extracting this implicit knowledge and so on. Most of them are rule based. Well, the first one is obvious, is in the name, a uh, rule engine. Uh, triggers in some way are uh, rule based. Tableau algorithm are typically reasoners in uh, the protege, hermit, pellet, pellet, and so on, are based on a Tableau algorithm. 
that is again some sort of a rule based algorithm uh, procedure and so on so in general we can in a sim maybe in a simplistic way speak about rule-based reasoning hmm? in which we have some rules we can imagine them in a if-then format so if something happens then do something else if a condition is met then perform a conclusion or go to a conclusion that combine the assertion contained in a knowledge base with a set of logical rules that could be defined by you or could be defined by a standard no matter in this moment but combine the assertion the statement of a knowledge base with a set of logical rules to derive a new assertion new information from that to make this again implicit information explicit and in this type of reasoning we say that any time a set of statement matches all the condition in the first part of the rule then the statement in the conclusion are implicit in the knowledge base and are true if the condition is met we also say especially in the semantic web for what concerns ontology that uh, our rule based reasoning uh, at the end of the this process of matching you have or true rules or rules that you cannot say if they are true or false mainly because the open words uh, assumption that ontology have so this is for example an example of two rules for reasoning so the first one say that if class one is a subclass of class 2 and an instance is of type class 2 then that instance is also type class 2 that is for example similar to the case of the canine the mammal that we say we saw before and notice that in the first part we have two con two statement two triple in and so both of them could be verified if both of them are verified then we can say that that instance that uh, is of type class one is also of type class two and this is an information that we put in an in implicit way in ontology and that is made evident from this rule and for example the other class is again the other rule is again of same, the same type class two is subclass of class one and in the same time class 3 is also a subclass of class 2 then class 3 is also is class 1 is the same type of class 1 this is another type of rule for as for example that doesn't insist on instances but on classes and in general <coughs> we can have different rule system and different rule sets so we can have rule system that for example support conjunctive rules a and b implies c, c then something is met disjunctive a or b implies c or negation is failure not a implies something else b these are possible rule system where you can have a rule system with just conjunctive rules or a system with negation and conjunctive or conjunctive disjunctive or with all three it depends of the rule system that or the reasoner that you are the type of the reason that you are using and similarly rule set are different they can be predefined like the OL semantics that uh, for which the reasoner work on or you can have your custom set of rules in which you extend you apply this you try to get this implicit information from the knowledge base not according to standard rules or well rules for example but uh, or well semantics but by defining your own set of rules because you know what is in the knowledge base and you want to extend that in some way so <coughs> as i said before as i said before inference is applying the set of rules 
upon this knowledge base. And as you imagine, in, in the literature, in the programming uh, domain, there are various approaches on how to perform this inference because the, the space of all possible applicable rules is huge, potentially. And so we have two main approaches that are used most of the time together, a again, in general, in a rule-based system. We have the forward chaining approach and the backward chaining approach. So the forward chaining approach are how it works. So let's imagine that we have this first, um, let's say an ontology here with some fact. We have some explicit fact that are fact one and two. And the forward chaining <coughs> start from the first fact. So for example, here from fact one and try to apply a rule that has fact one as the if part. So in this case, uh, the reasoner find a rules that link fact one with fact three and then it starts from fact three and look for another rule and it find a rule and it find a rules sorry and it find a rules that link fact three with fact four and again it look for a rule starting from fact four and go to fact five then it look for a rule that has fact one and two for example, as an, as an antecedent, and it doesn't find anything, and then it looks for fact two, and perform the same step, and it didn't find anything, and so it stopped here, the process. So the reasoner uh, performed this entailment, discover the link between fact one, and fact three, fact four, and fact five. That was implicit in the knowledge base. So maybe fact one is subclass of fact three, that is for subclass of fact four, that is a subclass of fact five. So we also know that fact one is, for example, a subclass of fact five. And nothing could be say about uh, fact two instead. The good part of this is that if we add a new knowledge, we don't need to recompute everything from scratch, but we can start from the new knowledge that we added, typically. And so if we st stop here the process, the part, the entailment about fact one remains stable. So let's imagine now that we add fact six. So for fact one, we have the same process. For fact two, we didn't have anything before, but we add fact six, fact six, and what happens? That the reasoner try to apply a rules for fact six, it find the rules that link fact six with the seven, and so it draw a connection between these two. Then it looks for rules that as an antecedent fact seven, and it looks and it find two rules. One that link fact seven with fact nine, and the other one that has an antecedent fact two and fact seven, and link both of them with fact eight. And then from fact nine, it doesn't find any rules that link them to another fact, while for fact eight, it links to fact 10. So again, this is a process in which you start from explicit fact, try to apply rules, by considering the facts in the ontology and go up, go again, go, go up to the end of these uh, rules that you have and all the facts that you explicitly have. So for each explicit fact, you apply rules and you see this graph, let's say, these paths that are um, creating for your ontology. Backward chaining is the opposite. You don't start from explicit fact. You didn't build, so uh, the advantages of this uh, forward chaining is that you can, uh, if you add a new fact, all this part will remain stable. You don't have to compute it anymore. The, the consequence 
uh, a negative aspect of this is that if you are interested in only FAC10, you have to build everything to reach FAC10. To be sure that FAC10 only is involved in this rule, because the, the process starts from the explicit facts. So if the ontology is, if the, let's say the ontology is very large, this could be quite time consuming, by quite memory consuming, and could end in a lot of time. Backward chaining instead is the opposite. It starts from a specific fact in which we are interested in. We are interested in understanding if fact 10 as some rules is some connection with some explicit fact. We don't want to understand whether fact one has some entailment, fact two or fact three have their all entailment. We are just interested in fact 10 that is already in the ontology and the link between fact 10 and one of these explicit fact. So the backward chaining works backward as with respect to the previous approach. Starting from fact 10, put fact 10 as a consequent of a rules, the then part, and say there is a rule in which in the antecedent have something different from fact 10 as a consequent fact 10. And in this case, you find that a rule fact A, if fact 8 is true, then fact 10 exists, and so put this arrow backward. And then it does the same things, there is a, a, at least one rule that has fact 8 as the consequent of the conclusion of the rules. Yes, there is one that involves fact 7 and fact 2, and then there is one that uses fact 7. Yes, there is one that links fact 7 to fact 3. So this is uh, quicker than the other, because you just are interested in some specific fact, but it doesn't uh, build the entire entailment of the ontology, just one portion, if it exists. So as a comparison, something I already saw some, say something. So for the forward chaining, after the reasoning process, you have an entire model, a reasoned model of your ontology with all these implicit facts made, let's say, explicit, that all, so that all the queries all the navigation that you can have on the graph are straightforward because you already have everything but can be uh, computationally intensive at the first run especially because at the next run you can rely on what the uh, algorithm already built uh, much memory may be needed for inf the inferred model because you are typically storing the reasoned model uh, in memory and it's also difficult to update, not when facts are added, but when facts are removed. Because here, if we, sorry, if we remove fact uh, eight, uh, we have to recompute what? Everything from scratch from here, it's difficult to say. So typically when you remove a fact, you start from scratch. And so if you have a very huge uh, ontology, is again starting from the first time to uh, reasoning about everything. In this other case, for example, removing a fact is much more easier because if we remove them, that fact then doesn't have any rules, so if the process stops there immediately. Backward chaining instead does not compute the whole model, so you don't have a reasoned model of your ontology, just a small portion. However, it's usually faster because you only compute a very small path, typically small fact. However, also each query that you need to do on the ontology needs to recompute part of the ontology because you don't know the query, because the query doesn't know if the part that is querying is reasoned already or, or not. So before performing the query, you need to uh, reason on a large portion of the ontology that you need for the query, a portion of the, the ontology that you need of the query. And so in this case, caching, for example, is essential just to avoid recompute everything more and more time. 
there is no startup overhead, obviously, because it's only a portion. There are lower memory requirements, and the efficiency depends on the exploration strategy that the specific algorithm uh, performs. In general, <coughs> uh, these two approaches are mixed according to the cases. <coughs> so this is, in general, when we speak about reasoning in this domain, inference in this domain. Now let's try to refine that a little bit uh, for what concerns OWL semantics and let's introduce some profiles for OWL. Uh, OWL. So in OWL2, you have uh, two types of uh, semantics. The first one is called direct semantic or OL direct semantic. And the second one is called RDF based semantic. They provide two alternative way of assigning meaning to OL to ontologies. And, okay. and these two semantics can be used by reasoner or other tools to check class consistency, substantial, instance, queries, and so on. They produce two different, let's say, level of OWL. The RDF-based semantics uh, produce what is called OWL to full. Uh, very briefly, RDF-based semantics uh, define a set of semantics, a set of rules, that say that every RDF graph under certain not particularly strict condition can be considered as an ontology, an well ontology. So this is potentially good because every RDF graph in the world could be considered an ontology, so reason it on from the other side, this has some problem. Uh, partially, for example, well, the first problem is that oh, well, too full is not decidable. So there is no algorithm right now, there is no reasoner right now that is able to reason, to infer the full content on, of a oh, well, too full ontology. Basically, you can perform some part of reasoning, but not perform the reasoning on the entire ontologies because uh, in the way it's in the semantics is defined, you have uh, infinite rules that always applied because they are very loosely defined just to match every RDF graph, the syntax of the RDF graph. And then, for example, another problem is that, um, so these RDF-based semantics see any RDF graph as an OL and vice versa is just an extension, let's say COL as an extension, a superset of RDF without too many restrictions. And so, for example, in RDF, you, we, we saw last time that uh, in our university ontology that we created some classes and we created some instances of these classes and, we saw, and we say, I said that they are two different things sometimes instances doesn't exist in an ontology and you have classes. In RDF, you don't have classes and instances. You have triples. Everything is the same thing. You have daisy. Daisy could be a class. Uh, in a triple, you can have, uh, let's say, individual, but it's not different in RDF between an individual and a class. They are triple. Just URI put in a triple in RDF. There are no special meaning for that. So in this way, you put together, let's say, individual with classes. You mix together individual with classes. And so you have to reason on these two different things that in reality you are not able in this semantic to distinguish between them because they are just triple. And so this is interesting, but it's rarely used also because for this reason, for other similar reason and also because it's not decidable. So this exists, is OWL full, is the most general OWL uh, level, profile, let's call it profile, it's not 
properly correct, but it's the most general OWL super file, but is scarcely used. What is used a lot, typically most of the OWL2 ontology are OWL DL, that are ontology that are decidable and answer the direct semantic specification. That is, all the ontology that we saw up to today, so the university ontology, the lecture about ontology, were mainly about the DL profile. That is just a restriction of the RDF that applies some uh, restriction again on RDF and RDFS and put in, in, in the model, in the, in the structure of the ontology, the description logic, in particular the first order a subset of the first order description logic that is more restrictive than the full of well to full, but the advantage is that of well DL is decidable. So you can build reasoners that perform a full reasoning process of your ontology in some times, let's say, but it, it go to a hand eventually. And they can, so these reasoner, these ontologies, these tools in OWL 2 dl can be implemented for real and can be used for real. So most of the ontologies, OWL2 ontologies nowadays are OWL DL in general. So <coughs> just as a reminder, uh, these are the OWL DL class constructor, constructor in, so for example, we already saw the, the, the max cardinality, the mean cardinality, sum, all value from, the complement, the union, and so on in various uh, syntax. And the axiom that a well DL support, subclass, equivalent, disjoint, uh, difference, uh, properties, inverse of. Hmm? Last time we saw uh, uh, an object property, we defined two object properties, one the inverse of another. So this is an axiom of a well DL. And well, and a well DL has a set of fixed reasoning rules. So any reasoner in a well DL like Pellet, like Hermit, uses these and others that are not reported here, rules to reason about an ontology, to make, to infer new knowledge from an ontology. So for example, I've seen, yeah, I don't, find it anymore but you see that these rules are made with for example if a condition and another condition and a third condition then this new fact is true and so on then when the w3c uh, define a well full and a well DL that are let's say the standard the high level profile high level description of, of well 2 they also decide to define three profiles of, of well that are considered a subset restriction of a well DL mm -hmm. uh, that are again decidable like a well DL, but are typically more efficient in some way, in some cases, or more convenient than a well DL in some condition. So profiles are sub-languages sub that offer different advantages in particular application scenario. The three profiles are EL, QL, and RL. And each profile is a syntactic restriction of, of well, DL, and they are always, always more restrictive, less expressive than a well, DL. And each of the profile trades off different aspects of 
the expressive power of, of well to gain computational or implementational benefits for uh, the working ontologies. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, last time, two of you had, uh, uh, or at least two of you, had an ontology that, uh, in which the reasoning process doesn't end in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Get stuck in the uh, classifying properties or something like that. So maybe eventually, in 10 minutes, one hour, three days, the, the reasoner will stop. And maybe he will say that ontology is not consistent after three days, but it will stop eventually. With this profile, what they are trying to do is to avoid, for example, this type of problem and having reasoner smaller, quicker, and less computational express, less computational intensive, but they trade off, they remove some expressive po power to have this advantage. So, that, well, this is the, the idea you have a well two, full, that is basically everything, and then it is basically not used. Uh, then you have a well DL, and inside a well DL, you have EL, QL, RL, that has some. A portion in common among them and other things that are not in common among them. So, oh well, EL stands for existential qualification quantification language and enable polynomial time algorithm for the reasoning task, while a well DL is not polynomial time. And it's particularly suitable for applications that are very, very large ontologies but you don't need too much expressive power. So it trades the expressive power for performances on large ontologies. Uh, typically, a well EL uh, ontologies, uh, I'm going by memory, um, have not a lot of classes, not a lot of properties, but they have a lot of instances, a lot of individuals mm, that must be classified and checked. Then you have a oh, well QL, the query language, that enable queries and queries in SQL, like SQL, because it uses standard relational database technologies. Try to mix the semantic web world with the uh, database world. And finally, you have the OLRL rule language that again enables the implementation of a polynomial time reasoning using rule extended database technologies operating directly on RDF triple. So again, it's particularly suitable for application in which we have lightweight ontologies, small ontologies with not so much classes, but that are used to organize a larger number of individuals and where it's useful or necessary to operate the data directly in form of RDF triple. Because maybe you have a RDF graph from another point of your application, or you need to exchange data from a simple RDF in, in RDF format, for example. Again, obviously, any of these sublanguage, YEL, RL, EQL, are, of course, an OL2 ontology, an OL DL ontology, or an OL full ontology. So they can be interpreted in either with direct or the RDF based semantic. So if you have an OL EL ontology and you put it in Protege and try to reason upon it with Hermit, no problem because Hermit and Protégé consider the EL ontology like a DL ontology. And it's fine, because the EL just avoid, remove some expressive power, some constraint on the ontology, but it works. Obviously, you lose the advantages of having you decided to use an EL ontology, because you put again in the DL uh, domain that is much uh, more expressive and that require reasoner that work quite slowly. 
in, com in parallel to the uh, EL reasoners. Mm -hmm. So you have just the, the pick, to depict this, you have the OL full that is undecidable, then you have OL2 DL that is decidable in, let's say, long time, and then you have triple five, two of them are polynomial time incomplete, and the other one that is less than polynomial time complete. Mm -hmm. So it's very quick. And you lose, obviously, some different portion, of, and they have some differences. Here you have RDF, um, a strict uh, um, link with RDF. Here you, uh, you based on database technologies. And here you have instead dedicated tools, dedicated uh, reasoners uh, that work well, but lose some expressive power. So, just to give you some further characteristic of these three um, profile, in OL EL, OL EL is fairly expressive. Uh, some of the OL DL ontologies could be rewritten basically without any problem in EL. Um, <coughs> because it has a fairly expressive property ascension but for example it doesn't include the inverse so you cannot have in EL an, an inverse property you have to define by n that one is the inverse of the other you cannot rely on the the concept of inverse and its negation disjunction universal quantification also are forbidden you cannot have a, a universal quantifier in an EL ontology while in DL you can. Yeah. And then there is this uh, oh well to profile document, the W3C document, a recommendation that define with all the needed details the three profiles. So this is the feature overview of the oh well to EL. In which said, for example, that this junction, class negation, uh, inverse, uh, minimal cardinality, maximum cardinality, exact cardinality are not allowed in EL. But the reasoning is much more, it's much faster than in DL. In QL, instead, you represent key feature as entity relationship or UML diagram. So you move towards the database world. And so it's particularly suitable for representing database schema and for integrating such schema in a query writing language of a little bit higher level than SQL, than provide the one provided by databases. And capture mainly most common feature in RDFS, a small ex uh, uh, extension. And for example, again, it's forbidden the existential quantification of rule to class expression, property chain, equality among concept, and so on. Uh, RL instead is for application that requires scalable reasoning without sacrificing too much expressive power. It was designed to be as expressive as possible while allowing implementation using rule and rule processing system only conjunctive rules, so not negation rule, not disjoint rules. Uh, and in this profile, we cannot easily talk about a noun individual in our superclass expression. And as some restriction as well. Uh, for example, this allows statement where the existence of an individual enforces the existence, the existence of another individual like in OLDL, you don't have all this. This is just to, to know that these things exist. Hmm? So, uh, no well, so let's speak about OLDL reasoner. Hmm? Uh, that is the, the profile, the language that we are using. So, as a normative definition of a well DL reasoner is quite strict in reality, and so reasoner are typically much more than this. 
uh, the official norm normative definition by W3C, W3C is that an OL reasoner, that is an OL consistency checker, takes a document as an input, an OL document as an input, and returns one word, consistent, inconsistent, or I don't know, basically. So it's quite restrictive. In reality, you have at least four step in this uh, reasoner. The first one is consistency checking, that is the one that uh, defined the normative definition, which ensures that an ontology does not contain any contradictory fact. Then you have the concept satisfiability, which check if it's possible for a class to have any instances. So if a class is unsatisfiable, then defining an instance of the class will cause the entire ontology to be fully inconsistent. Then you have classification hmm, that computes the subclass relation between every class, named class, to create the complete class hierarchy. And that class hierarchy can be used to navigate, to answer queries such as getting uh, all the direct subclass of a given class or all the individual of a subclass of the given class. And realization which find the most specific class or the most specific classes that an individual belongs to. So maybe explicitly an individual belongs to one class, but in an implicit way it belongs to multiple classes. So this step gives you all the classes that for which an individual belongs to. And obviously realization can be only performed after classification because you need the entire graph realized, classified before understanding whether an individual belongs to a given class or, or not. Then here you have some uh, OL DL uh, reasoner, uh, the, the most common and included uh, or includable in Protégé are uh, fact uh, plus plus that has um, that is made in C plus uh, plus. Hermit, that is the standard reasoner in uh, Protégé right now, that is uh, made in Java, is open source, uh, and uses this uh, hyper tableau algorithm that make the reasoner much more, much quicker than, for example, Pellet. And Pellet 2, that is another reasoner, is quite old, uh, is made in Java, and also support OLDL, exists an OL 3.0 reasoner that is commercial, however, and so they maintain the old reasoner, the Pellet 2.0, as open source and freely available, and the Pellet 3, that is, an improved version of this, but is uh, you have to pay to have this uh, the reasoner in, to have and use this reasoner. Mm -hmm. Typically, in Protege, you have Pilot two, Hermit, and sometimes Fact plus plus. Mm -hmm. Of the three, the most complete and quick right now is Hermit. Five years ago, I would say Pellet, but now it's Hermit. Fact++ plus plus is quicker, typically, than the other, but it's less complete than Hermit or Pellet. Okay, so up to now, we spoke a little bit about inference, what is reasoning, and then we have this semantic profile, this different semantic profile that have some rules, let's say already defined by W3C, and the reasoner takes these rules according to, for example, the back chain or the, the forward chain chaining algorithm and apply these to the knowledge base that you have. And these are, let's say, normative rules, rules defined by the W3C. Uh, in the ontology world, uh, you also have the possibility to define your own rules. 
So to perform some, let's say, inference process, separate from the reasoning and by using your own rules that you defined. And this is possible with SWRL, that is, uh, stand for Semantic Web Rule Language, that is not an official W3C recommendation, so it's not standard in that way. Uh, that extend a well language to support custom-made rules and custom-made inferences. The form of this, this, uh, the rule that you define here are, in this, as before, in the form antecedent and consequent. If something is true, then something else should be uh, inf inferred. And, well, the meaning, as before, is whenever the conditions specifying the antecedent hold, then the conditions specifying the consequent must hold, so hold. Mm -hmm. Both the antecedent and the consequent uh, uh, consist of zero more atom part. Uh, the antecedent, uh, if it's empty, is treated as true, so always. And the consequent is also as treated as false if it's empty. So given this antecedent, if the consequent is false, everything that met these rules is automatically false. And multiple atoms in the antecedent or in the consequent are treated in conjunction, in and each other. So the structure, for example, is here you have an atom, so a portion of a statement, and another, and another, and another, as many you want. Then there is this arrow, and then you have the consequent in the same exact format, an atom, and another atom, and so on. Just to uh, give you an example, so SWRL has some syntax. There is an abstract syntax, an XML-based syntax, an RDF syntax, and a, a human-readable form uh, that is, let's say, the only readable for real. And so these are some examples of S SWRL rule. So let's, let's read the human-readable syntax. We say that x1, x2 as, are in the relationship as parent, and x2 and x3 are in the re relationship as brother. If this condition hold, then x1 and x3 are in the relationship as uncle. And so the example say, if John as Mary as a parent, and Mary has Bill as a brother, then Joel and Bill as an uncle. This is not something that you have with standard or where rules because it doesn't have the concept of uncle or parent or brother and so on, but it's something that you may have or you may need in your ontology because your ontology is about uh, parents and uncles and so on. So you want to know who he is uncle automatically, who is his uncle of who, for example. So you can write this rule and apply this rule and so new knowledge is inferred in this way uh, this is another example of inheritance this is a bad example it's here because it's a bad example because this is this is valid student one if, if x1 is a student, that implies that x1 is a person. It's a valid rule for SWRL, but it's an improper usage because this should be done directly in OWL because, as a subclass, because we are saying that student is a subclass of person. So we can define that in a well without any problem. The other things, the uncles, maybe not, but this. It's just a subclass. Student is a subclass of a person. So we, can, we should 
in this case define that in OL and having the reasoner, the OL DL reasoner, to infer the needed information if there is any needed information. And this is a little bit more complex and this is something that you cannot have in a well, again, uh, because I say the style of an art object is the same as the style of its creator. So you have an art object, you have a creator, the creator has a style, and you would like to say that the style of a specific art object is also is the same of its creator. So you are here, you are applying some properties from an individual to another totally different individual. You are not building a relationship, like in the first example, you are not building subclasses like in the previous example. You are just trying to transfer some specific properties from, like as a style X, from an individual that probably is a person to an individual that probably is a statue. So, this last example, for example, main cannot be described in a well, mainly because in a well you declare a relationship between classes. In a well you say that a property as a as a domain a class as a range in other class, you are not speaking about instances. <coughs> then an instance of that class inherits the properties of the class, but it doesn't have any particular instance by its own involved in the reasoning process. So here, instead, you can define relationship with the last rule between individuals directly. That is something is not possible in the well. So it's exactly, you may not spread that specific instance as such properties. The instance as the property of the class that contains it. <coughs> uh, on the reverse, uh, well, as a declarative nature, you declare things, basically, while SWR is oper more operational. You apply these rules in the way without knowledge, without checking in consistency, without building graphs, without classifying, without realizing, you just apply your rules to see if that specific knowledge is true or can be inferred. In Protege, if you want to uh, enable SWRL, you have a SWRL tab, I will show you, and uh, differently from the reasoner that apply the rules with a given algorithm uh, directly in by its own, this as well needed a rule engine to apply your rules, and in Protege it uses the rules rule engine that the process is uh, hidden to the user that are these OL well rules. Uh, SOL rules are transferred, are converted and transferred on rules, that drones are running, and uh, the inferred statements are transferred back to OL and Protege in this case. Yeah, here you have some, inf some additional information if you want to uh, explore more. So here you have in the, wheel, in the window tabs you have a uh, SWRL tab in which you can enable it and you have here some information so you see press the OL plus SWRL button to transfer the rule the ontology to the rule engine and then run and so on you can create a new rule in which you give a name of the rule a comment if you want and uh, the body of the rule and you can then run all of them you see them all all of them here and in protege as you see the reasoners are here i just have hermit 
installed and when you press start reasoner as we saw last time you have reasoner active here and uh, possibly the reasoner somewhere Okay. infer some knowledge so for example these offered by uh, Polytechnic Torino this course is offered by because it, it builds it classified the entire graph the entire tree and navigates that and so it's able to derive to infer this information by looking at the various chain of properties that the ontology have inside mm -hmm. uh, and you can also in the preference of protege in the reasoner tab remove or add which uh, element do you want to have in the reasoner in, to display in the ontology so for example by default it doesn't uh, try to perform and display inferences among disjoint classes or it doesn't fill domains and ranges for object and data properties and for individual as well so you can just uncheck some of these and restrict the the operation let's say and display the behavior of the reasoner or just enlarge it a little bit and notice that when i uh, go again on the reasoner menu i don't see any more start reasoner if i have performed no other operation i see only stop reasoner if i change something in ontology i so i i can see synchronize reasoner and this should remind you the forward chaining algorithm so that the reasoner, the ontology, maintains the state of the reasoned graph and with synchronize just compute, try to compute the remaining part of you. If you delete, deleted something, it try to recompute everything from scratch. Okay. Before, so this closes the brief overview on semantic reasoning. Just to give you an idea of how it works, the inference process, the rules process of the uh, of well. Here you have some references, just in case you are interested or you should would uh, I don't know, for example, go depth on SWRL or build some SWRL. Before having a break and the after the break, my idea is just to present you this one um, that could be of interest maybe more on computer and electrical engineering I suppose maybe not so much for designers maybe I don't know um, but just a brief overview on what you need if you want to get an ontology and put it in a piece of software that does what you want and not just rely on protege or on other tools maybe you need to perform some reasoning operation some query let's say operation in a software program a software application and so which tools do you have which frameworks do you have to perform this operation a brief overview with this with an example then we will have a break and as i told you before this let's call it exercise this exploration of the reasoner in your own ontologies just to better understand what you can do what you are expecting to do so for example uh, if in our ontology here we put uh, like last time uh, that uh, where is here we put teaches maximum zero courses we get an inconsistent ontology because uh, uh, the teacher in our ontology has is Fulvio Corno that teaches semantic web so it teaches one courses so max zero with one is not compatible but for example if we say that teaches minimum two courses do you expect the ontology to be inconsistent or not this is 
there are some of them that are tricky part maybe you you can imagine that is inconsistent because okay i defined just one courses this is minimum two why should not be should be consistent and then in other cases you discover that this is not true because for example the open world assumption so try to to reason to let's say make an exercise upon this change something in your ontology or if you have an ontology that doesn't uh, end the reasoning process maybe try to understand why the reasoning process take this very long uh, exponential time to complete and not as quick like this one and so on So right now we have seen uh, we have seen RDF and basically online tools for uh, creating, managing, uh, executing SQRL, um, SparkQL qu queries, and then we have seen Protege that you create in the user interface, new classes, new instances, start the reason process, uh, and so on. So. Uh, here i would like to give up some hints some suggestion on uh, what you need if you for example you would like to have to create a software application that handles a rdf triple store or to write automatically some rdf or to exchange some rdf or to reason upon ontology modified ontologies in code instead of with uh, protege so again, as a recap, we have such editors and such reasoners, and we, for tools, we stick with Protege 5.x, and as a reasoner, right now we are using Hermit, that is the reasoner in Protege. This is one of the default reasoner in Protege. We yeah, just to remind how to create an ontology, determine the scope, reuse terms, classes, properties, constraint, instances, and back. So now we are in the process, at the point of the process in which you are able to create an well ontologies, and you are able and you want to query some SparkQL endpoints. And the question is how we can do this programmatically. So without opening a web browser and going to a SparkQL endpoint, writing the query and see the result on screen. And then, okay, it is interesting. This university has five number in this result. And now what? If I would like to include this knowledge in my own software application, how can I do this? Uh, obviously, not by end you can parse uh, rdf on a well ontology by end if you have time but uh, typically is not something that uh, normal people does uh, ju just to to give it, to show you one thing if i open you know as uh, RDF that are text document. Also, uh, oh well, is a text document. It's plain text. This is the, the raw representation of uh, the ontology that is open here in Protege. And it's made in, let's say, XML, in an XML format, it's saved in this way. And so it has some tags, well specified, so you can parse these and work on this. Maybe you cannot have a reasoner, but you can implement a reasoner if you want. And so you have here some, you have the individuals here. Where are they? So this is, for example, the Bachelor of Science on Computer Engineering, that is of type Bachelor that offer courses computer science and uh, mathematics and has a degree name that is Laura Trenale in Engineering Informatica in Italian. So all the information you have here in Protege, yours have obviously in the text file. And so you can handle this. 
as I told you last week, uh, since Protege, for example, doesn't have the uh, copy and paste function, if you are expert uh, enough, uh, you can, well, I need a uh, Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering, not in Turin, but in Barcelona, for example, I can copy and paste this and just edit in the text by looking at every reference or just rename this here, just to rename every instances of the, for example, bachelor class, if I want. It's an extreme precise uh, word task, but you can. But typically, if you want to include uh, them in a software application, you can use uh, some frameworks. So two frameworks are the most popular, the most used, and the most supported right now for the semantic web uh, domain. They are in Java. It's extremely difficult to find well-done framework and libraries, well-maintained, well-documented frameworks not in Java, in this domain. Protégé is made in Java. Hermit is made in Java. And frameworks, the main frameworks for working with this, uh, in this domain are two. The first one is Apache Gina. That is an Apache project that gives you support for everything, almost everything that is related to RDF, SparkQL, RDFS, and so on, up to excluding ontologies. Uh, because Gina support OL1 and quite old reasoner for OL1. So typically Gina is used for all the RDF SparkWell part. For OL, there is a library uh, developed by Man the Manchester University, the University of Manchester, uh, that is called OL API, that is made and works only for OL. So it has no support for RDF, it has no support, this is important, for SparkQL, because SparkQL is a query language for RDF. It's not a query language for OL. There is no query lang official query language for OL. There are some no standards, pseudo -spa standards, standard de facto uh, query language for OL, but SparkQL is not for well. You can query an well ontology with SparkQL because under, under well you have RDF. So you, in reality, with SparkQL, query the RDF graph of the ontology, but you cannot rely on any specific properties of well while querying in SparkQL. So well 2 well API doesn't have support for, OWL, for SparkQL, so you cannot query as in SparkQL, an ontology by default in the framework. So, a couple of words about Apache Gina and uh, a well API. Apache Gina is a free and open source Java framework for definition, building semantic web and linked data application. It has a website, as you can imagine, and it is composed by several APIs and several command line tools. So they have, for example, some parser and writer to go from RDF, Tartle, uh, Ntriple, RDFA, RDF XML, and so on. Uh, as some RDF API that can be called directly, as some ontology API for a well one, and a SparkQL API for performing SparkQL queries on the underneath RDF graph. As some inference API, as some reasoners for RDF and for OL1 only. It has some also store MPI API to store RDF, like a triple store and so on. So it has support for in memory, for storing uh, RDF in a SQL database, in a native tuple store, or in any custom, if you want, uh, database of that structure. 
It's an Apache project, so it's well maintained. It has a lot of tutorial and sample code. And as I told you before, basically don't use Gina for ontologies because it has no support for OL2 and it has no plan for adding such a support. So it's not suitable for OL2 ontologies. It's great for RDF, SparkQL, Linkerd Open Data, Triple Store, whatever, but ontologies in OL2. So, and how you create an RDF in, a, in Gina is, a, as I told you before, in Java. And how do you create an RDF? So you, for example, to create the RDF exemplified there, you define some string, then you need to create an empty model. Then you have to create the resource and then add the various properties to the resource. So you create a resource person, URI, you add the properties full name, that is John Smith on, on my right. Then you add another properties that is combined with other two properties, a given name and a family name. So you create your RDF in this way. You can also obviously save, save the model created with the right method and you can also specify the format hmm? Tartle, RDF, XML, RDFA, Entrapo, Entripo and so on. Obviously you can also read, hmm? this is a short example, to read an RDF written on disk. And you can also perform a SparkQL query. Uh, in Gina, SparkQL query are executed through a dedicated engine that is called ARC. Mm -hmm. That is a standard SparkQL query. It has also a free text search via Lucene, that is another Apache project. As access and extension of the SparkQL algebra, a property function for custom processing of semantic relationship if we have some self-defined uh, semantic relationship can uh, perform some type of aggregation group by as a sign uh, assignment of sparkql can also be a client for a remote sparkql endpoint like you experiment in the browser you can also write a software application that work as a client for that sparkql endpoint and basically, it's quite straightforward. You define the query, like in text here. So you say that the prefix is friend of a friend, that is uh, that one. You would like to select something where contributor is me as a name, friend of a friend name, and my web blog is that URL. Then you define the string with the missing parameter then you create a string, the real SparkQL string, um, link together the query with the underlying RDF model to perform the query on, and then you execute the query and get the result. In this way, with this result set for matter.out, it prints the results in a table format on screen, like the the normal, say, uh, SparkQL endpoint that you saw in the browsers. And then you clo close the query execution object and to release memory and to perform new queries. So it's quite straightforward. <coughs> so I didn't provide you an example of this, just these slides, because Apache Gina has a really huge documentation and tutorial. It's very well maintained as most of the Apache projects. So if you're interested in RDF and that part, Apache Gina is the, the way to go, basically. For the well, instead, you have this OL API. OL API is the library that Protege uses. Protege is made in OL API. So everything that you can do in Protege, you can do with OL API and vice versa. Again, it is made in Java, and it also provides a reference implementation for creating, manipulating, and serializing, so writing on disk, for example, OL2 ontologies. 
It has a website on GitHub. It's again free and open source and is created, was created and is currently maintained by the University of Manchester, by the OWL group of the University of Manchester. So right now, OWL API includes the following components. It has an API for OWL2 with an in-memory reference, so you can open a an OWL ontology reason on it and store the, the reasoned model in memory without too many problems. It can it able to parse and write RDF or uh, XML for ontology in format RDF XML or OWL XML and in functional syntax, Tartle, and it also support SWRL and it has a reasoner interface towards basically all the reasoners that implemented this interface that right now are fact c++ hermit pellet and racer pro that is again a commercially available project so again it has the same reasoner that you can find in protege uh, it has uh, obviously some documentation in a wiki it's less structured than the Apache Gina documentation. Uh, it's scarce and not a lot updated sometimes. Uh, it has Java docs. And currently it has two versions that works in parallel. There is the version 5.x, that is the cutting edge, the new version, that is Java 8 and 9, 10, 11, and so on available only and then there is the version 4.x that is the stable version also the 5 ver the five, version 5 is stable I, they call it stable version because it's more it's older and is for java 7 on and is the version that is currently used by protege so they maintain probably version 4 alive because Protege is using that version. It's not moving to version 5 right now. And for version 4, a difference from version 5, there are several examples available right now to be to use for a well API. Uh, a well API has uh, some data structure that are fundamental well, you imagine that one of them is the OWL, OWL ontology that is an in interface that for modeling a set of logical and non logical axiom with a given name a URI and some method to retrieve this axiom then you have well the entity that is anything that can be identified with a IRI with classes data and object properties, individuals, everything that can have a uh, ERI. And then you have oh well axiom that is the say the basic unit unit of this library uh, with three types of boxes, the axiom, the T box that describe the relationship between class and, cl and class expression, A box that describe a relation between individuals and between individuals and class and the air box that describes the relationship between properties. But basically is one class that is axiom. You can create and load an ontology. To create an ontology, you have to create an ontology manager because you typically, uh, also to load an ontology, because you typically, uh, a well API uh, is forced to have, to handle different ontology also separately if you want, so you may have an ontology manager with one ontology and another different ontology manager with other three ontologies and work separately on them. And why you need a manager? Because you maybe have your, let's say, university ontology, but your university ontology import the friend of a friend ontology and another custom made ontology and you need to upload, load all of them in your uh, model in your 
in your code to reason about, about on it and to perform, uh, let's say, query upon it. So you can create an ontology with the create ontology uh, method or you can load an ontology with the load ontology from ontology document method in which you can pass here or a file on disk or a online resource as well. And uh, OWL API put everything together in one ontology manager. Then you can save the ontology in various format, including RDF, XML, if you want. And uh, I prepared, uh, just for you, uh, an example that uses a web API, since documentation is scarce for that, that is available here. There is also the link on the website that basically import the university ontology we developed last time and it loads the ontology, perform the reasoning process, and then ask for these four things. The university individuals, that in our case should be Politecnico di Torino and Politecnico di Milano, then ask for which degree each university offers, which courses each degree offers for both university, and who is enrolled in those courses. So our ontology was not uh, populated a lot but some, some of these information were available and you can get it from uh, github uh, just uh, about requirements it uses a well api for the latest four four five four not uses a well api five right now it uses the uh, hermit reasoner the latest version of the hermit reasoner that should be downloaded from here not from the hermit website because it, it sometimes doesn't have the uh, proper interface for linking with a web api and all dependencies are handled uh, with a uh, gradle so you import these in uh, eclipse or intellij idea and run the dependency in the gradle file and it should be able to download uh, uh, hermit or web api their dependencies and you can run this program hopefully just to show you how it works and how it's made it's quite simple in reality It's basically it basically has just one class with the main. So as you see before, uh, as we have uh, reported in the slide, it creates an ontology manager. It uh, load this uh, university OL that is from a local folder that is called the resources. This is in the project. Then he try to load these and print loaded ontologies. And to be sure, sometimes to be sure, since an ontology is a, a could have typically have a public on the web uh, URL, uh, to be sure that you are loading your local copy or the web uh, available version, it's useful to print out the location for which you are importing the ontology so that you can immediately see if you are for some errors loading your local copy or the web-based uh, the web the, the version that is available on the web just to have a quick check on which ontology you are loading because sometimes you prefer to load your local version because you are working on it and it's slightly different from the public version but you don't want to change the uri of the ontology the entire ontology because you want to uh, publish the new version of ontology as soon as read, ready. In other cases, you maybe want to uh, fetch the ontology from the internet and uh, use that 
because you don't want to perform any change or you want to test if everything works. So it's always sometimes a good idea to print the location where you are working on ontology, the location for which the ontology is um, retrieved. Then uh, you need to, if you want to create a, a reasoner, so you open this reasoner factory, you need to attach a progress monitor to, if you want to see the reasoning process, 0%, 1%, 10%, 100%, and with simple configuration, because it's mandatory, then you can, in the factory, that you can create a local reason, a reasoner for the uh, given model with set that configuration, and then you can start the reasoner with these pre-compute inferences, with inference types values, that is, please perform a full inference check a full reasoning process for this uh, ontology here you if you want you can pass some specific type of inference you can say please reason only on the classes or reason only on the properties here in this case you say reason on everything that you can reason on then uh, um, well, define a prefix because it's needed. And then there is the, let's say, interesting part. Since you cannot use SparkQL to query the ontology, if you want, for example, get all the university, you have to navigate the graph, basically. So the first thing is get through the reasoner get uh, the instances of the classes university and this is hard coded because you are looking for all the university and so through the reasoner get the instances of these classes you can also perform the same uh, get instances method not using the reasoner but in that case you are querying the raw ontology not reason ontology so you may miss some instances because the class has not that direct instance associated in this case you are sure that you are getting all the possible instances for that class not only the one that you explicit explicitly defined but also that one that are implicitly defined so you get that and so you have the university in the, in, with this line and uh, you then this get flattened is for having the, the flattened version of the ontology just to uh, not the overall version but the let's say basic java version of the ontology of the um, of the set to to, um, uh, to print it or to uh, cycle on it then for each of the individuals in this set you get the short form the short form is just the final part of the ARI not the full path not http slash elite.polito.it slash ontology slash university slash Politecnico di Torino but just Politecnico di Torino without the prefix and then to get the university name you create a ERI and you perform a data property search just to link the university with its uh, offered degree because the offered degree are uh, properties that apply to the classes so you need to move from the individual to the direct uh, superclass and from the direct superclass get its properties and the property that you are interested in a and so on basically it's a lot of four 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 to get all this information and if we run this you see that the reasoner is quite fast like in protege and you see that we loaded the ontology from file from the resource folder and here you see the reasoner that is starting first of all it builds the class hierarchy with some 
percentage, then it classifies the object properties, then classify data properties, then initialize class instances, then every step of the process of the reasoner. This is just the reasoner that do and print this by its own with this uh, simple configuration and the console progress monitor that uh, I created. And then it prints the information that we, answer, we, we look for. So the individual name, Politecnico Torino, this is the name of the individual, this is the name that we inserted as a string in Italian, in that case, then offers degree, this is the name of the short name of the individual, and the full name as text that we define and the properties. So it offers degree in the Master of Science in Computer Engineering, that is called the Laura Magistrale. It offers degree a PhD con in Control and Computer Engineering, that offer courses that is semantic web and is followed by is not teaching in this case is followed by an individual that it's me that is a student in this case then it offers another degree in a bachelor of science that offers two different courses that are not followed by anyone because there is no this information is not present in the uh, ontology and then it performs the same operation from Politecnico di Milano, but that it has in our ontology is empty for what's concerned of the degree of her course, so it just printed the individual name. And then he said that all universities, two in this case, were extracted in 0 0.305 second. And this time is the time for printing this out, for performing these, let's call them queries, and all the reasoning process starting from the reasoning process up to this point in, on this computer is this time. Mm -hmm. And notice that, uh, consider, not notice, that uh, mm, uh, uh, reasoners are typically the heaviest and the slower part of all this process and uh, they doesn't, uh, at least hermit, uh, last time I checked, uh, doesn't uh, mm, use this multiple core if, it's, uh, if they are available. So it's single thread, single process. So if you have an eight core at two gigahertz or a uh, Pentium 4 at three gigahertz, probably it's faster on the Pentium 4 computer because it's just mono thread and mono process. So it uses just one core on your computer. And this is a, a limitation, but it's also understandable because <coughs> if you have to compute rules among facts, it's also difficult to, under, to, to decide for the specific case which rules and which facts should go in a process, in a thread, or separate from other rules to be applied. And then if you have rules that come together, you have to synchronize everything. So it's, it's difficult to understand it from a design point of view because ontology are very different from one another. So, well, this is just a, an example if you want to work with ontology, if you need to work with ontologies. Um, and these are the two frameworks, and you have plenty of example for uh, Gina, and <clears throat> this small example, that is a complete example, because you look for individual, you look for object properties, you look for data properties, and you look for classes. So the main elements of an ontology are all looked and uh, retrieved in this way. And it's, well, uh, public on GitHub, so you can download it and uh, use, that, use it if you want as a starting point if you need to, to do something else. Okay, so now we can have a break and uh, we we'll conclude then this uh, lecture with this, uh, let's call it exercise, let's say in 15, 20 minutes just to, to have a, a real break. <clears throat>